really pleased to introduce Carrie Martin. Um, Carrie uh, recently retired from a career in the healthcare field um, to pursue his passion for growing food. Um, he's currently working on a second bachelor's degree in sustainable food production at USU. Um, Carrie's interested in small scale farming and producing food that's nutritious and diverse in sustainable ways. Um, and uh, he, he's gonna talk to us about a project that I helped him work on. It was one that he came to me and uh, asked some questions about. And so we decided to put a little project together for him. And he was an, he's a presently an undergraduate student here at USU and he is also one of our extension interns. And, and so he's gonna talk a little bit about some of his uh, attempts to improve tomato growth and yield via using LED lights versus greenhouse grown transplants. So with that, I'm going to give Carrie the, the stage. All right, thank you. So I, I just want to give a little bit of background before I get started on uh, my farm and how I came to uh, have that farm. So basically I've been growing gardening uh, most of my adult life. And about 12 years ago, when I thought about, well, what am I going to do when I retire? I decided that it would be a good idea to get a larger piece of ground. And so that's what I did. And uh, so at that time, um, I got about two thirds of an acre and I finished it off with, uh, with some valve boxes that are specifically uh, put into place so that I can run drip irrigation and that sort of thing. I've had to recondition a lot of the soil because it was a new construction and they took off a bunch of the, it was an alfalfa field before um, it was my house. And so I basically had to recon, uh, recondition a lot of the soil. And I've done a lot of things in order to do that. Hence my um, interest in uh, basically uh, soil management and good soil management practices. And I've noticed that a lot of organic um, management practices are pretty consistent with, uh, best, with best practice. And so I've tried to do a little bit of organic growing, but I do not, I am not certified. And I do leave my options open for um, best practices. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get started on why I chose to do this. So, I started with the hypothesis that there is really not going to be a difference in yield between traditional greenhouse and LED plugs. So the question is, why do I care? Well, one of the things that I thought about when I got this property is when I retire and um, I, I will have more time to develop this, this out the way that I want to. And part of that plan was to build a greenhouse so that I could start my own plants, I would have increased flexibility um, on what I grow, when I grow it. And so my analysis was basically, well, I can put in a greenhouse and then I did the cost analysis on that. Or maybe I can just start an indoor propagation room inside my house. And that's, I figured out that that would be a lot cheaper way for me to go because I already had a a space in my house that was already had heat, it already had light and it already had water. And so I thought, well, I, I do want the um, increased plant diversity. If I want to choose more nutritious plant varieties, I want the ability to, to uh, just plant a few of those and versus what I can get um, locally at, from a greenhouse. Okay, so um, some of the things that you have to consider when doing indoor door gardening are basically growing media. Now, because I was interested in looking at organic things, um, I looked at availability of organic mixes and I really found that they're not all that available at local nurseries. And so I did uh, reference uh, an organic receipt that comes from a res, uh, re reputable source and that's listed in the reference section. This is a picture of uh, basically uh, conventional propagation mix. And typically they will have 
both nutrient and wetting agents include, included, and they are easy to find. There's a whole lot of other ways that um, things can be started using peat plugs, soil blocks. I think it's something that you just have to uh, review, uh, uh, do some research on to figure out what works best for you, okay? Another thing to consider is the tray and or container size. And Dr. Drost has done a nice extension publication on this that's also available in the reference section. But here on this picture, we see 128 plugs versus four by four plugs. And you can see that with the 128 plug, you're gonna get a whole lot more plants than a four by four in a limited amount of space. The main thing to consider though with the size of tray is really the transplant date and uh, looking back and saying, okay, well, if I want to start, if I want to transplant uh, middle of May, what size of plant do I want at that time? And plant in a tray um, consistent with the size that you want. The goal is to not plant in something that will become root bound. There are several different types of lighting options. Uh, the one that I'm talking about in this presentation is LEDs. And the reason why um, I have chosen LED is just based on a little bit of research uh, where I found that they're becoming really popular because they're highly efficient in the amount of light that they um, give out compared to the heat that they generate. And LED lights also um, cover the full range of the plant spectrum and they, they can, um, they have varieties of lights where you can control which plant spectrum the light um, intensity is at. And so you can research different types of plants that require different lighting requirements. Really nice, so really nice options in that area. I have used fluorescent bulbs in the past um, to do my starts. Um, they do work, and but they do have to be uh, closer to the canopy than the LED lights, and they do, they're not as efficient. Um, I don't know much about halogen lights other than they are, I know they're used in large spaces. I know they generate a lot of heat and I know they're costly. So I didn't even consider those for uh, my propagation room. We've already talked a little bit about the, um, the light spectrum. So let's go ahead and look at the LED details. This is a picture of my propagation room. And what I did in, with this is basically I made adjustable shelves. This is a five by seven room that I used. I uh, lined the back wall with uh, Panda um, fabric, which is basically, I have dark film on the one side and reflective film on the other. And so basically I have adjustable shelves and if I wanna close a section off, I'll just put that Panda film on the sides um, and the front so that it is very reflective. And then I can use another part of this room for uh, vegetation growth. If I'm starting, I can do seeds and uh, vegetative growth at the same time. I use the Lux Clone 9000, that's what these bars are. And I'm not advocating that these bars be used. I'm just saying that's what I used uh, based on what I had at the time that I bought these. Um, but I would suggest doing, if you're serious about doing this, um, do research and figure out what would work best for you. I had my seedlings in the light 12 hours and, the, uh, <clears throat> and dark 12 hours. And then when it was vegetative growth, I up to that time to 16 hours of light and eight hours of dark. I had the, those lights at 12 inches off canopy when they were seedlings, and then I moved it to eight inches when they were in their vegetative growth stage. The nutrition that I used was fish emulsion uh, because, again, because of my organic focus. 
my temperatures uh, I kept at 70 degrees daytime and 64 at night. And uh, the trays that I used were 128s at six weeks post trans or pre transplant and eight weeks. And then I transplanted into four by four trays at four weeks so that I had, I could compare each of these. Okay. The, the greenhouse uh, condition, I used the Kaysville Farm greenhouse, which was less convenient for me um, because I had to drive there every day and, and check on the status of this greenhouse. And th this greenhouse is not uh, fully automated. And that was fine with me because when I wanted a greenhouse that would kind of simulate a greenhouse that I was in my price point if I decided to build one. And so um, this, this met my needs in that way. It used natural sunlight. I used the same amount and the same fertilizer for these uh, starts as I did with my LED room. And I found that the, the temperature was much, um, very much more variable and um so i think um i think that may have contributed to some of the results that i have seen okay so these are the re results at four weeks that i saw comparing the greenhouse and the led room we can see that the led room bottom right hand corner um, had a higher germination rate it had a higher plant height higher inner node length and a much uh, larger uh, leaf area uh, compared to the greenhouse. But again, I wonder if that was because of the variability in the temperature, okay? Uh, at eight weeks, we also see um, an increase in the LED room plant height, slight increase in the number of leaves, and you notice that the LED room had a lighter coloration than the greenhouse. And I'm not sure why that happened, but I, my suspicion is that um, because they were larger plant sizes and I kept the nutrient amount the same for both groups, I wonder if uh, they could have used some more fertilization, but I don't know that. What's interesting about this graph on the, the average leaf area, is if you look at the difference between the four week and the green, the eight week on the greenhouse, we have about a 13 centimeter difference in growth. Uh, and you also see about a 13 centimeter difference in growth between the LED room, four weeks and eight room weeks. But what is interesting is if you look at the greenhouse four weeks and the LED room four weeks, um, it's also about 13 centimeters. So this tells me that most of this growth, um, the, uh, uh, that growth difference occurred in that very, very early stages of the, of the seedling growth. And so um, again, I wonder if that's temperature driven. Next, okay. The field conditions where I transplanted these um, consisted of being at the Kaysville Research Farm. I transplanted these on May 21st and um, I had eight plots, basically two plots for each of these four conditions, one LED, one greenhouse. And again, the 128 trays. I also um, uh, put shade cloth on one of these rows and because I wanted to compare shade with um, non-shade and for the those shade cloth all I did was put uh, rebar in the ground took a PVC uh, schedule 40 bent it over put it in another uh, rebar on the other side and then covered it with uh, 30 percent shade cloth you can see that uh, this was done in plastic mulch using drip irrigation and the tomatoes were staked okay I did four weekly harvests between August 20th and September 17th, where basically I just harvested everything that was right on all plants. I, I collected fruit count, fruit weight, 
the yield per plant, the average fruit weight, um, and the I did a little bit of quality analysis because I noticed I was getting radial and concentric tracking on both the LED and the greenhouse fruit. Okay. So I had some um, harvest, some field issues with my harvest. I, I, three of the beds that I um, tried to compare had curly top virus, uh, one in the shade cloth, one in the four by four plugs, and one in the LED 128 trays transplanted at eight weeks. And so basically these, this analysis were, was removed from uh, this presentation. What's interesting about this graphic is that uh, you can see that the profound effects that the LED with the virus had in the comparison between the greenhouse 128 at 88 weeks and the LED at eight weeks. But if you look at the greenhouse 128 at eight weeks and the LED four by four at eight weeks, you see that they're very similar. You also see that the greenhouse during this harvest, the greenhouse at six weeks was um, pretty similar to both the LED and the greenhouse at eight weeks. Okay. I did one final harvest where I basically stripped off all the tomatoes on October 11th off of one plant to represent the all plants on those rows. And again, you see that the LED with the virus uh, did very poorly. Again, you also see that there's not much of a difference between the uh, 128 at eight weeks and the LED four by four at eight weeks. But you do see a, dip, a difference between the eight week and the six week at the final harvest. And I attribute this to the eight week transplants uh, were just larger to begin with. They, they um, grew to a larger plant size um, in the field and therefore had more fruit to harvest at, at this point in time, okay? All right, so my observations were basically that uh, the LED room uh, favored increased germination, larger plant size, but there were some color differences that um, I speculate were fertilization uh, uh, related, but I don't know that. I did have field conditions which affected the yields, and basically I had to throw out uh, three of my study rows, and I also had radial and concentric cracking based on environmental conditions. The greenhouse 128 and the LED 4x4 had similar final yields, and my 128s at eight weeks had a larger total yield than six weeks. Okay, so what I concluded is this. There were no significant differences in yield that I could tell from this between LED and greenhouse grown plugs. I, I learned that growing transplant indoors with LED technology um, is a lot easier than, um, than using a greenhouse when you're not there and not in control of that greenhouse at all times. The greenhouse uh, management, uh, the greenhouse had some management issues with the temperature, which I've already talked about. And uh, the plant size may contribute to larger final yields, but I'm not sure that that was the effect of the container size. It could have been more the effect of the age of transplant. And I know there's ongoing research on sizes of containers and that sort of thing. And I know that it's um, also something that is different for each type of cultivar that we're, um, that we're planting. And so a lot of this, uh, just needs, I think you just need to research it to make sure that um, you're getting the right size for the, what you're trying to grow. And the big thing that I learned is environmental conditions have a large positive and or negative effect on total yields. I think any of us that have grown things already understand that. So there's nothing, nothing new there. 
Okay. All right, so the question would, would the future or additional work uh, that would be necessary to really answer this question? From a scholarly perspective, I think we, th this would have to be replicated because I don't think I've really answered the question from a scholarly standpoint, but I think um, I have answered the question from an operational standpoint. So in other words, I think that I'm satisfied with my decision to make a, a propagation room in my house and not bother with building my own greenhouse is the way that I'm going to go in the future. And I can learn a lot more about uh, how to um, manage that indoor gardening space. I, I showed you that I had that uh, Panda film. I can. I can partition the room into a seed starting area. I can uh, do vegetative growth. Um, I can get lights that uh, are more on the red and far red spectrum so that I can do flowering plants and get into uh, indoor gardening with tomatoes and that sort of thing year round. And uh, I'm currently taking a class up at Utah State on hydroponics. And so I won't, uh, my next foray into the future is to kind of start playing with that a little bit. And with that, I will turn it over to questions. Yeah, so good, Carrie. Um... There's an evaluation of Carrie's presentation that should have popped up on your screen. We really ask that you take a moment to, to do that. And then I'm going to advance one. I'm helping Carrie here. And here are some of those references that he referred to for if you want to know kind of where he got some of his information. And you can um, look at that while he's answering some questions. I've got a few people that threw some questions at me. Um, First off, uh, it, the one of Shirley asked about um, how did you measure the leaf area? And did you do that destructively or did you do that some other way? So basically what I did is I took the length of the leaf and the width of the leaf and um, I put that into a formula for leaf area. And I just counted up all, I, I basically took um, all leaves off of eight plants, counted them up, and then um, put them into a formula and uh, in Excel and come up, came up with the leaf area. Okay, good. Another question from Sherlyn was, um, the seed, were they seeded directly in the four by four plugs or did you transplant into those? And could you tell us kind of how you actually did that? Sure. I did transplant into the four by four plugs. I started everything in the 128 trays and I did uh, take at four weeks, I took um, six plants out and I transplanted those into four by four pots. But that's a, good, that's a good question. Why not just plant into the four by four plot, pot? Um, I think that's, yeah, I, I don't see a difference between the two other than I probably stress the plants a little bit by transplanting. And also, um, if you start with a whole bunch of four by fours and you don't have a lot of room in your grow space, that might uh, be a consideration. Good, okay. And uh, a couple questions about, you know, did, I think you mentioned it, but I, I don't know if you did. What variety did you grow? Or the, is it a determinate or an indeterminate type? Uh, you know, people were questioning and wondering about that as well. So I used the Celebrity, which is basically a kind of a in between. It's a it's a nice hybrid plant that has a lot of good reviews and it's very productive. And it gets to be about three four feet, and then it just kind of. So I'd say it's kind of a semi determinant. 
Okay, good, good use of terms. You, know, you learn something in my vegetable class at one point. <laughs> I can, yeah. I can, I can kid with Gary. Gary and I have a long history. So, um, another question that someone asked: uh, Could you talk a little bit about what causes radial and concentric cracking, and what's kind of the differences? Sure. If we go back to that slide, the radial cracking is uh, where we saw the split coming down the center. So for example, this tomato uh, has this, to, this middle tomato bottom row has both. Yeah. And the radial uh, cracking is that long one that uh, Dan is pointing to right there. And the concentric is that ring. Now, my, I'm not the expert on this, but from my understanding is this is a, this is a heat, dryness and watering issue. And um, so basically what happens is as this fruit is growing, the skin is stretching. And um, depending on the amount of water it gets or doesn't get in relation to how hot and dry it gets and when the water, and it, if it's hot and dry and then it gets a bunch of water, it could contribute to this condition. And um, I, I should have paid better attention in my <laughs> vegetable class. I'm not sure that there's, um, th I think they're both caused by the stretching and the water related issues. Um, but they're, they're both related to that. Just, just as a sidebar, I used to tease Carrie a lot when I would, when he was working with me and we would grade, we would grade him and, and I will, I will say, Carrie, you get an A for that. So yes, you did remember what we talked about in vegetable class. So that's just between Carrie and I, he knows what I'm kidding him about. So um, one other question was, do you see there, there are some cost advantages between cost advantages or differences between greenhouse and LED systems? And well, that, that that's actually a very good question. And I kind of wanted to have this conversation and I think I, I answered half of it. So back to the, the, the greenhouse situation, Dan and I had this conversation. Is it always cheaper um, to try to grow your own starts? And the answer is it really depends because I think if you're a big grower and you, uh, um, get your seeds and you and you need a lot of transplants and you get those from a greenhouse and that works for you that's probably a cheaper option than trying to grow your own um, now if you have to build a greenhouse or if you want to build a greenhouse and control those variables that I talked about the varieties that you grow and the time frame that you are starting your seeds then um, I think it will, it's absolutely cheaper to do it indoors than try to build, grow your own uh, greenhouse and have it regulated. You know, I, I just think about if I, if I don't, if I have a greenhouse, I have to be around to vent it. I have to be, unless it's all automated and then you get into pretty big price points when you get into automating these greenhouses. And so, from that perspective, I think it's cheaper. If you're small scale and you want um, some flexibility in what you grow, when you grow it, um, then I think a, a, a propagation room is not a bad way to go. And LED lights are not that expensive, um, but that you can get expensive ones if you want all the bells and whistles. Um, I mean, they have apps you can control your LED lights from your phone, you know, just like everything else. So. Okay. Well, that